All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Rob Gutierrez, president of the California Taxpayers Association. We are excited for our upcoming program, and I'm glad you can all um, be a part of us. Um, we are about 28 days out from the election, and we'll find out in a few weeks what happens with split roll. Uh, I'm chairing the opposition campaign with Alan Zarenberg at the chamber, Rob Lapsley at the round table, and Rex Heim at Business Properties Association. By now, hopefully you've seen a, a one or two of our television commercials, and uh, some of you may be getting mail from us in the next uh, few weeks. Um, and just yesterday, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative donated another 4.5 million to support the Yes campaign. So funding for the opposition is critical at this point. And if you'd like more information on that, you can contact me at rob at caltax.org. Uh, Prop 15 could bring uh, one of the greatest changes to California's tax structure in more than a decade. Um, in, I'm sorry, more than a generation. And um, for 42 years, Proposition 13 has guaranteed certainty through acquisition value assessments, rate limits, and treats all locally assessed property owners uh, uniformly. Caltax is committed to preserving these protections. And we hope that through this webinar series, um, you all learn more about the significance of these proposed changes and share this information with your colleagues, friends, and neighbors. So with that, let me introduce today's speakers. Uh, we've got David Ardor, uh, Caltax's semi-retired chief tax consultant. Uh, before coming to Caltax, he served as the chief consultant for the Assembly Revenue and Taxation Committee from 1963 to 1987. He watched the earliest days of the property tax revolt firsthand, oversaw uh, property tax reforms after the assessor scandal of the 1960s. And in 1978, he was charged with the task of making Proposition 13 work. Uh, his comments today remind us all of um, what things would be like if we return to a pre-Prop 13 world. We're also joined today by Brianne Rabowski, a partner at Pillsbury Law's uh, Silicon Valley office. She focuses on state and local tax controversy work with an emphasis on property tax issues. She also leads Pillsbury's, Pillsbury's real estate practice. Uh, Brianne works with clients through litigation, audit compliance, and tax planning. And she has managed uh, and resolved property tax appeals in nearly all of California's 58 counties. Today, uh, Brianne will be walking us through our current property tax system and how um, property tax law has evolved since passage of Prop 13. Uh, this is a, the very system that Prop 15 would disrupt and bring so many questions to issues that are now settled law. And then uh, my colleague, Ben Lee, uh, Caltax's in-house tax counsel will close us out. Early on, Ben worked with myself, Dave Dorr, and others to draft Caltax's analysis of Prop 15. Uh, ben will give us an overview of the provisions of the initiative and prepare us for our ongoing discussions about the drafting flaws of Prop 15, administrative issues, and the appeals process in the uh, webinars to come. Uh, CPE credit is available for this webinar and um, an application for MCLE credit is also pending approval from the state bar. We will be contacting attendees with credit information at the conclusion of this webinar. So with that, let's get started. The property tax has been controversial ever since it was imposed in the 1850s. Uh, periodic flare-ups. And it basically, it's because it's not a good tax. Let me, uh, quote from the report the committee issued in 1966. And I'll just read this paragraph. Based on the latest available data from the State Board of Equalization, peer equalization of all assessments is more a myth than a reality. However, it is quite unlikely that property is assessed in totally uniform manner in any assessment jurisdiction anywhere in the United States. The State Board of Equalization admits, quote, no assessor, even when given unlimited resources, could produce an assessment role in which the appraisal of property was strictly current and precisely accurate in all respects. The assessor is faced with an impossible task of completely 
and accurately appraising all property in its jurisdiction. The state board is, was constitutionally established in 1879 to equalize assessment ratios throughout the counties. But it didn't do that for, I'd say, the 20 years prior to Prop 13 because of the political pressure from assessors that didn't want uh, their assessment rules raised. So they never never hit 25%, but a lot of them came in between 20 and 23. But uh, the rising assessments, in my view, was the number one trigger for the property tax revolt. The big problem was the unfair, unfair, unfair assessments. And let me quote from the report I just read the paragraph of to show you what the assessments were. In 1965, on commercial property in San Francisco, as most people know, perhaps they don't, the State Board of Equalization samples uh, a selected group of properties in each county uh, to see how the county assessor is doing and what the county assessment ratio is. So for their sample in 1965 in San Francisco, here is the ratios they found on the commercial properties that they checked on. They had one at 6.5%, one at 8%, one at 11, four at 10, one at 12, three at 13, four at 14, three at 16, three at 17, two at 18%, one at 19, two at 20, two at 21, two at 22, four at 23, five at 24, and three, at the 25% ratio, one at 26, three at 27, two at 28, one at 29, one at 38, one at 32, one at 33, one at 44, one at 33%, one at 44%, one at 36%, one at 55%, one at 37%, one at 38%, one at 35%, one at 32%, one at 37, 38, 41, 34, 37, 35, 33, 31, and 42. So that gives you an idea of how bad the assessment practices were at that time. Uh, nobody felt that they were getting a fair shake in terms of the value of their property. And that is because it, it is inherently impossible to use the ad valorem method to get a correct assessment of property. It assesses opinion of value. That's a subjective test. It's not an objective test like the actual selling price, which is under acquisition value. Even the selling price, we have to pull out the intangible values, which we, uh, with the tax sponsored Manny Bill in 1975, I think we went a long way in, in doing that. But it's much more objective with an acquisition value than the opinion of one man one person, excuse me, of value. Now I can explain why the assessors aren't that incompetent. It's just that it's impossible to determine value. You can, I can illustrate why. There are three approaches to value. Let's look at them. Comparable sales. For business properties, there aren't that many sales between October 1 March 31st, determine what the value is on the lien date. Even if there are the sales, the properties aren't generally comparable because business properties tend to be fairly unique in, in their construction. Then you come to the land value and it's location, location, location. So that is very hard to determine what the land value of this particular build under this particular building is. So the whole idea of location influences the selling price. The second approach is replacement cost less depreciation. It is very difficult to estimate the cost of building a new building. 
We know that from the bids on public works, for example, take the bullet train. Uh, then you have to plug into that depreciation because you're not assessing a new building. Some buildings depreciate faster than others. Some may not even depreciate. So there's no really set way to get an accurate determinant of depreciation. Then you have to build an obsolescence. And then that's, we're just talking about the building. You still have to determine the value of the land. And there you have a problem because of location. So it's difficult to use the replacement cost method. Then we go to the third method, which is income. And it's very difficult to forecast what income will be generated from your purchase of the property. If people knew that, we'd all be great investors. And it's not easy to do. So with three flawed approaches to determine value, it's very difficult to determine the unlearn value of property that has not been sold. Uh, and that's why we get these assessment ratios that are all over the map. And that's what we'll get if we return to the old system of assessing. I don't think the proponents really realize this. They talk about this vast equalization, everybody's treated fairly. Nobody's treated fairly under the old system and it will come back exactly the same way. There was great pressure on the legislature uh, during this period. The assembly tried very, very hard to, to approve uh, the situation. But as I said, I believe the number one issue was, as I just described, assessment practices and assessment burdens. But the legislature did enact the tax rate limits. Now, a bill in the assembly by Dan Boatwright would have required the tax rate to go down as assessment went up. That bill was killed in the Senate, as so many other uh, bills passed by the assembly went to the Senate. Uh, the Senate Democratic leadership did not favor uh, property tax reform, simply put. Uh, they were very uninterested. At one point, the Senate, de facto Senate leader, George Miller, Democrat from Contra Costa County, threw Assembly Speaker Jess Unruh off the Senate floor because he was over in the Senate lobbying for property tax reform. And he said, let him foul his own house uh, and threw him off the Senate floor. So the fights between the Senate and Assembly go have a long history. But the Senate was or blocked property tax reform. The assessor can't be the town planner and say, as he did in Watson's Wasteland, all these homes will be used in a different use. Uh, fortunately, we fixed the uh, highest and best use problem for homes after Watson Wasteland. We put another measure on the ballot when Watson had his measure on the ballot, limiting the assessment of homes in areas where they're zoned for homes as homes, they couldn't use the highest and best use. They could still use it on homes where they're in, on say agricultural zoning or other types of zoning. So it's not entirely solved, it wasn't entirely solved. But for commercial or all other property, highest and best use is still a, a factor that was used in making assessments. And it just, who decides whether that property will ever be converted to to another use? The assessor says, I could believe it will. Well, how can you prove a negative? You can't, say, well, it's not going to be. Nobody knows. So the assessor's judgment would often prevail because there's no way to prove that he's right, but there's no way to prove that he's wrong. We tried to pass major property tax reform and Governor Brown held to his $250 million limit. Meanwhile, Jay, Jess Unruh, former Speaker of the Assembly and now State Treasurer, announced that there was an obscene surplus of something like $6 billion. And Jerry Brown's $250 million relief program for a few 
homeowners didn't look so hot and uh, made it look even worse to the voters. Howard Jarvis was a Southern California businessman, uh, originally from Utah, who got interested in property tax problems in the early 1960s and formed a group of taxpayer organizations who were protesting taxes in Los Angeles County. There were about six or seven independent tax fighter groups that were organized as, as people that wanted property tax relief and reform. Paul Gann was uh, another person who tried to uh, provoke, prop, uh, I shouldn't say provoke, to initiate property tax reform in Northern California in 1960 or 1976-77 period, but was unsuccessful. And so the two combined together in with Jarvis in Southern California and Paul Gann in Northern California, collectively they got enough signatures with Prop 13 on the ballot. But they didn't know what they when it passed, they wanted to implement it. No, I would say that there was a split. Most wanted to implement it. There was a faction within the Democratic caucus that favored let the blood run in the streets. Let's not implement it. And let's watch everything collapse. And that'll make Prop 13 look bad. But Speaker McCarthy was totally against that. He said, voters have asked us to do this. We were elected to be responsible to voters. So let's put a good faith in in implementing it. So that was the majority opinion that carried great weight, and we did. I was the chair. We met from October of 78 into January of 79, devising a bill to implement the acquisition value assessment system. The bailout had already been decided, but we still had to put all the nuts and bolts on how to assess and be consistent with Prop 13. So we invited everybody. I, I got as many different views in the room as I could. We had assessors, a spending lobby, bureaucrats, legislative staff, academics, uh, attorneys. Not everybody agreed with all the re task force recommendations. The State Board of Equalization didn't implement, uh, didn't agree with our implementation of new construction, for example, where we wanted to exempt a lot of the minor new construction from being reassessed under Prop 13. As, and they wanted, they wanted a very broad reassessment, any kind of new instruction or new roof or stuff like that. So there was a lot of mixed views, but once and we would then vote on it, and they didn't get voted down. <laughs> and uh, the legislature took what we recommended, and that was that. And the implementation plan worked beyond anybody's fondest expression. Everybody first thought, well, we'll implement it, but after one year, there's going to be a problem. After the results of the first year we're in, we had a meeting with Speaker McCarthy to show him that based on our analysis, the, the one year, what we call bailout, could be continued indefinitely without harming the state's fiscal problems. I remember that meeting very well. It was the day San Francisco Mayor Moscone was shot. <laughs> we were in his office in San Francisco, so it's one of those strange coincidences. But, but the legislature then, in good faith, implemented it. And the implementation has worked for 40 years. Prop 13 has worked. Nobody thought it would, even after it passed. All right, and with the conclusion of that, um, this is our first polling question. There will be three total polling questions that we will be asking. Uh, throughout our webinar today. And this is uh, simply one of the requirements um, that the Board of Accountancy here in California requires for CPE credit. 
Okay, and then with that, I think we're ready for Brianne to give her presentation on California's current property tax structure and how it works under Prop 13. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. I'm happy to be talking with you here today. So I have been given a very tall order, which is to describe to you California's current property tax system under Proposition 13 in about 25 minutes or so. So we're gonna keep things pretty high level. Um, there are tons of nicks and crannies that we could explore lots of detail in this area of the law. Um, if you have questions, I encourage you to contact me either directly or through Rob. I'm happy to answer questions following the presentation on any uh, detailed inquiries you may have. So let's get started here. So as Dave described, um, Proposition 13 has many different components to it. And today we're gonna to focus primarily on the acquisition value assessment component of Proposition 13. And Ben, you can go ahead and move to the first slide, please. Um, and the reason we're gonna focus on the acquisition value assessments is because that's the component that's really impacted by the split rule initiative. So under the acquisition value assessment systems, Properties that are locally assessed are assessed based on either their purchase price or their fair market value upon acquisition or change in ownership or when it's newly constructed, plus an increase uh, for inflation not to exceed 2% each year. So that's the crux of the acquisition value assessment system. We are going to dive further into that throughout this presentation. But just for your own edification, Proposition 13 had three other main components. The other components include a maximum uniform tax rate at 1% of the property's assessed value. So for those of you who immediately are thinking that I'm wrong because you have property tax bills that have a higher than 1% rate, that's because there are certain exceptions to that, the largest which is bonded indebtedness. So when you see a tax rate above 1% on your tax bill, it's typically because of special assessments or bonded indebtedness. The other big things that Proposition 13 did was it required a two thirds vote of the legislature for increases in state taxes. It also required a two thirds vote of the electorate for increases in local special taxes. So those last two pieces are interesting pieces that are in the news for lots of different um, unrelated to split rule initiative um, things that are happening right now. So thought we would mention that. We'll go ahead and move on to the next slide and get a little deeper into the acquisition value-based system. So under section two of article 13A, which of course was added by proposition 13, real property is reassessed to its current fair market value when two things happen. One, when it's newly constructed, or two, when there's a change in ownership. And we'll talk further about what each of those mean in a little bit here. So what does Proposition 13 apply to? It applies to just locally assessed real property. And so in general, that means all types of property, whether it's a business property, commercial property, industrial property, or a home that you own. It does not apply in general, with some exceptions always, to centrally assessed property or to personal property. So for those of you who are fairly new to uh, California's property tax system, you may not know that there are two different types of um, SSE categories. There are those who are locally assessed, meaning properties that are assessed at the county level by the 58 different county assessors. And separate and apart from that, you have centrally assessed real property that is assessed at the state level by the State Board of Equalization. And typically that includes things like public utilities, telecommunications. There is a carve out under a special law for railroads where railroads do get the benefit of Proposition 13. But the general line is that locally assessed real property is what benefits from Proposition 13. And moving on to the next slide, you might be asking yourself, so what happens when the property is reassessed? What is the assessor required to do? Well, the assessor is required to establish what's known as the original base year value, or a lot of times just referred to as the property's base year value. 
And that's established based on the property's fair market value as of the date that it's either completed new construction, the date that it's undergone a change in ownership, or under Proposition 13, to the extent that there has been no change in ownership subject to reassessment since the early 1975 implementation of Proposition 13, it's still that 1975 lien date value. Um, under the original base year value, there is a purchase price presumption. So that means that the assessor should look at the purchase price in most cases as an indication of fair market value. Now, this is a presumption, and what that means is it can be legally rebutted. And so in most cases, you see um, the assessor, if it doesn't believe purchase price fairly reflects fair market value, arguing that a transaction, for example, isn't arm's length. So there's some reason that the purchase price doesn't reflect fair market value. But in, by and large, the vast majority of cases, the reassessed value will reflect purchase price. The other interesting implementation piece that took quite some time to develop following the uh, effectiveness of Prop 13 was the idea of supplemental assessments. So a supplemental assessment recognizes that for property tax purposes, it runs on a fiscal year. So your annual tax bills reflect a period from July 1 all the way to June 30. But what happens is you have these reassessable events, whether it's new construction or a change in ownership, that occur mid-year. And so what a supplemental assessment does is it comes in, it recognizes that mid-year reassessment and readjusts the annual assessment to pick up the higher reassessed value so that you're properly assessed based on the new base year value on a go forward basis. So usually what you'll get is a notice that indicates the assessor's fair market value, the establishment of the original base year value on the supplemental assessment, then coupled with a follow on tax bill to reflect the new base year value assessment. Following on the next slide, following the creation of the original base year value establishment, under Proposition 13, we know that there is an annual inflation factor that's applied. And that annual inflation factor is capped at 2%, but it's based currently on California's consumer price index. And that's an annual figure based on all items under California's consumer price index. So to the extent that the CPI index for any year is higher than 2%, property tax inflation factor is capped at that 2%. So what you see on the right-hand side of this slide is a table that's published annually by the State Board of Equalization. And it's showing you the annual CPI index as well as that 2% cap. And in any case that CPI is higher, it's capped at 2%. And as you can see, based on the highlighting, in the vast majority of the years, it's capped at the 2% because CPI index is much higher. Now, there have been instances historically, 1995, you can see as highlighted, where the CPI index was actually less than 2%. And in that case, you're actually using the CPI index. The only year in which CPI actually went negative was 2010. So that means in 2010, for the first time and the only time in history thus far, your factored base year value is actually going down on an annual basis because the CPI index is going down. Now, one interesting thing about the index base year value is if you start to read literature in this area, articles, annotations, you will note that it is called a number of different things. So I mentioned this so as you don't get confused when you're looking into this yourself. It's called index base year value, adjusted base year value, factored base year value, or for an extra layer of confusion, oftentimes simply just the base year value. So um, lots of different names there. But on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about declines in value. So at the basis of Prop 13 and its inflation factor is the idea that you have this ever increasing line. You have the original base year value that increases year over year by that inflation factor. Well, what happens when a property value actually goes below that indexed increase line? Because we all know, even in California at times, 
property values decline. Well, shortly after Proposition 13 was passed, just a few months later in November of 1978, Proposition 8 was passed. And what Proposition 8 does is it recognizes that decline in value. And it says that your property's assessment each year must be the lower of its current fair market value, oftentimes called its Proposition 8 value, and that indexing Proposition 13 base year value. So you get the lower of those two for your assessment. Now, this is a temporary reduction, and it took some time for court cases and other authorities to really sort that out. For a period of time, people thought that when you had a decline in value, that reestablished and set a new original base year value. Well, we know from court cases and other authorities that that isn't the case. A decline in value is a temporary relief, temporary annual relief that does not establish a new base year value. Instead, that 2% index in the background continues to increase year over year. And if we take a look at the next slide, you can see that portrayed on a graph here. You see the light blue line is that indexing line. You have your original base year value increasing year over year. And you see the fair market value swinging up and down over time. Well, under Proposition 8 and under the current assessment system, year over year, you're getting the lesser of. So what that means is in year one, you get an assessment based on your original base year value. After that, you see in our graph for year two, the index base year value is still the lower of. So your year two assessment would be an index base year value assessment. However, in years three to six, we see that the dark blue line or the fair market value line dips below for the first time the indexed base year value. And this is where decline in value takes over. For years three to six, you get what's known as a proposition eight decline in value adjustment, where the assessment is based on the current fair market value of the property. Now, in year seven, we see that the fair market value has continued to increase, whereas the um, over the factored base year value. So year seven, you're getting the Prop 13 protection. You're not going above that line. And that's really the magic of Proposition 13. It's that protection. It's that cap that you see in year seven, where you know that your property tax assessment is capped at your index base year value and not going any higher. So looking at the next slide, I know that Dave talked a little bit about uh, the battle that went into getting Proposition 13 passed and the constitutionality of Proposition 13. And as we look at the new split rule initiative under Proposition 15, there's lots of questions about the fairness of the current system. Is Proposition 13 fair? And part of that is because, as we've discussed now, every individual property has a different base year value. It has a different cap for their property tax assessments. And some say that that's unfair. Well, both the California Supreme Court as well as the United States Supreme Court have already addressed that issue and both have held the constitutionality of Proposition 13 and both specifically address the equal protection concerns surrounding Proposition 13. So the California Supreme Court for its part said that we believe that it may in fact be a fairer system than looking to a current value approach. And why is that? Well, the court reasoned that property tax should bear a reasonable relationship to the owner's original investment in that property. They want taxpayers to be able to fairly project their future taxes with some assurance. When you look at a current value system and you have, for example, in the chart we just saw, fair market values that are floating and ebbing and flowing over time, you have an inability to be able to project your future taxes and you have no control over what those future taxes are because you have no control over the current fair market value. So the court said that Proposition 13 is constitutional and it is fair. And it pointed to many instances in which taxpayers actually pay different amounts of tax on properties that are essentially identical. So a classic example of this would be sales tax. 
Say you go out and buy a lawnmower, regularly priced, you pay a certain sales tax on that. Your neighbor down the street likes your new lawnmower and decides go, to go down to Home Depot and buy the same lawnmower, but now it's on sale. That, that new sale will reflect sales tax at the lower sale price for the very same lawnmower. So the court said there are certainly instances in which taxpayers pay different rates, just as they do under Proposition 13. And the US Supreme Court in Norlinger mirrored pretty much what the California Supreme Court had said. And they said that Proposition 13 bears a rational, legitimate basis for furthering state interests for two real reasons. One is the continuity and stability of neighborhoods. And here they looked not only to neighborhoods as you know it and think about residential neighborhoods, but the stability of businesses in the area and the idea that it's important to have some continuity and stability there. And then of course, the same idea that protecting vested interested of owners in their properties, looking to original investments are really important um, and is something that's adequately reflected under Proposition 13. So let's move on to talk a little bit more about new construction as it triggers a reassessable event. So property is reassessed upon completion of new construction. So what is new construction? New construction typically comes in three different types. And this is a generalization here, but typically it's an addition to new property. So you think of an example like building a new building. Obviously that's an addition to real property. You also think in the residential setting of adding new square footage to a building. You, you know, add square footage to your kitchen. That's gonna trigger new construction. You also have, as a second example, major rehabilitation that brings a property to substantially equivalent of new. So you think of a decrepit old building that's nearly unusable. You take that and you spiff it up so that it's up to the newest standards. Substantially equivalent of new. That will also be considered new construction. And finally, you have the conversion of real property to a different use. And here you think of things like taking a space that's used for retail and converting it to an office space use, also accessible new construction. But there are several things that are not new construction. Those typically include normal maintenance um, and repair, routine replacement to the extent that those replacements are of the same fundamental utility and general quality. You also have ADA, seismic, life safety work in existing buildings that are excluded from new construction. And then finally, something that's getting a lot of current airtime, which is solar additions. New solar additions are also excluded from new construction under the California Constitution. So when you have accessible new construction events, what happens is the incremental value, the additional fair market value associated with just that new construction is what's subject to reassessment. And so that's a really important concept because say you've owned a property for a long time, you've owned the land, you have a building on it, you demolish that building, you build a new building. Well, the only thing that's subject to reassessment is that new building. The underlying land that you've owned for some time continues to retain its uh, original base share value as indexed forward. So you aren't getting a new assessment that captures the appreciation of that land or any other real property that hasn't been newly constructed. And again, this is an area where there's a whole lot of law around it. There's an entire assessor's handbook that I've noted there for you, section 410, that addresses just new construction. So lots of things we could discuss there, but we'll go ahead and move on to the second big type of reassessable event under Proposition 13, which are changes in ownership. So upon a change in ownership, real property is reassessed to its fair market value. Now, one interesting thing to note here coming off the heels of our new construction discussion is that a change in ownership triggers a loss of any exclusion that was protected by a new construction exclusion. So for example, solar, as I've discussed, has a new construction exclusion. Once that solar system that was exempt undergoes a change in ownership and has new ownership, it loses that new construction exclusion, is subject to reassessment, and is 
assessed on a go forward basis at its fair market value under the typical Proposition 13 system. So what is a change in ownership? Well, the general rule is a change in ownership occurs when there's a transfer of a present interest in real property, including the beneficial use thereof, the value of which is substantially equivalent to a fee interest. And here again, I'll note for you a huge area of law, a huge area of practice um, for property tax practitioners. And again, you see the State Board of Equalization having an entire handbook associated to the description of changes in ownership, and that's Handbook 401. So a lot of folks, we'll look at the next slide here, a lot of folks tend to think that changes in ownership are only triggered upon the sale or purchase of a property. You think of a typical example of somebody goes out and buys a home, that's, you know, classic change in ownership example. Well, it certainly is, but there need not be a sale or purchase to trigger a change in ownership. It could be a gift, devise, inheritance, some transaction through a trust, adding or deleting an owner of the property. It could be through a property settlement. So there are numerous different ways that a property could undergo a change in ownership. It is not just the sale or purchase. And in fact, there need not be payment or consideration included for there to be a change in ownership. So you'll notice at the top of the examples I gave is a gift. A gift, even though there is no payment, um, is something that would trigger a change in ownership. So to the extent that you have a change in ownership, how does the assessor know about it? How does the state know about it? Well, there are requirements that the purchaser file what's known as a change in ownership statement. And there are two general types of changes in ownership statement. To the extent that it's a change in ownership triggered by a real property interest transfer, so a deeded transfer is a good example, you file what's known as a PCOR, preliminary change in ownership statement. And I guess that that's something that most of you are pretty familiar with because it's typically what happens in the purchase and sale of a home. You file a PCOR along with the deed. But for legal entity transfers, which we're just about to talk to, talk about rather, you file what's known as a BOE uh, Form 100B, and you file that with the State Board of Equalization. So in either instance, reporting is required. So classic examples beyond those that we've given of a change in ownership include pretty broad brushstroke things. So any creation, transfer, or termination of tenancy in common, a joint tenancy, the creation of a lease to the extent that it's 35 years or more, as well as transfers of real property to or from a legal entity. So it's pretty broad what's captured in changes in ownership. However, as most of you probably know, there are a number of different exclusions to changes in ownership. Some of the biggest ones are proportionality exclusion, which we'll talk a little bit about more, um, interspousal transfers or transfers between registered domestic partners are also excluded and parent child as well as grandparent child to certain extents are also excluded. So there are certain statutory and constitutional exclusions to changes in ownership, but change in ownership is a very, very broad idea. So let's move on to the next slide. And here we're talking about legal entity changes in ownership. So legal entity changes in ownership are treated a little bit differently than transfers of direct property interests. So here the general rule is the transfer of a legal entity interest, so an interest in the entity, generally does not cause a change in ownership. But that comes with two very large exceptions. The change in control exception under uh, 64C as well as the original co-owner rule under 64D. So a change in control is when one entity or person obtains direct or indirect control, and that's more than 50% of the equity ownership in the entity that owns the real property. So for purposes of corporations, you're looking at equity ownership being the voting stock. For purposes of partnerships and most LLCs, you're looking at 
capital and profits, both of those two together. Anytime you have a new entity or new person gaining control more than 50% voting stock or capital and profits, you have a change in ownership. To the extent that you have multi-tiered corporate structures, you what use what's called the multiply through rule. And in the multiply through rule, what you do is you study the corporate structure tier by tier, multiplying through at each tier the ownership interest of the entity in question. And through that multiply through process, you determine the ultimate direct and indirect ownership that any one entity has in the entity owning California real property. Now, for a long period of time, there was a different rule that was in place. And it wasn't until fairly recently, 2014, in a very well-known case called Ocean Avenue, that we really learned that multiply through rule is the applicable rule for determining multi-tiered ownership. Now, when there's a change in control, all property that's owned by the acquired entity is reassessed. Now, that's different in this next exception that we're about to talk about, the original co-owner rule. And the original co-owner rule, when that applies, it's only the property that's previously been excluded that is subject to reassessment. So let's back up a little bit and talk about what the original co-owner rule is. The original co-owner rule says that there's a change in ownership anytime there's a cumulative. So this can happen through multiple transfers. A cumulative transfer of more than 50% of co-ownership interests. Co-ownership interests are created when there is an excluded proportional interest transfer. So you think of um, a usual example where you have a property that's owned 50-50 by two brothers. Those two brothers decide that they're gonna take their direct ownership in the property and transfer it to an LLC. To the extent that brother A and brother B still own 50-50 that LLC interest, there is a proportional interest transfer which ex is excluded from changes in ownership. And that's because brother A and brother B who used to own 50% directly still own the very same 50%, but now through an entity. So we have the same ownership structure before and after the transfer. That's excluded under the proportional interest transfer, but the result, the consequence of that is that A and B are now considered original co-owners and their interests in the LLC are original co-owner interests. So we now under the law have to do what's called count and accumulate transfers of those original interests. So say brother A, after it's in the LLC, decides that he's gonna take 20% of his interest and transfer it to third party C. That transfer of the 20% co-ownership interest is counted and accumulated towards the 50% threshold. So different set of rules there. And in that case, it's only the property that's been previously excluded that's subject to reassessment when a reassessment is triggered. So really detailed area of the law tons of examples, tons of nuances that we won't get into, but it is fairly complex. What I do want to do is end by giving you a couple of examples, and I think we'll just go through two here. So let's move, yes, to the next slide. So through case law, we have a lot of examples of situations that trigger legal entity changes in ownership. And one of the early examples we have is from Title Insurance and Trust Co., versus City of uh, Riverside from 1989. And in this case, you have, before the transfer, two separate ownership chains. You have Southern Pacific, which owns Speedcore, completely separate and apart from t -Corp, which owns Title Insurance um, and Trust Co., which in turn owns uh, Riverside Real Property. So you see that ownership structure on the left side of the slide. Now, in the transaction, SpeedCorp merges into t -Corp, and as a result, t -Corp is now owned 100% by Southern Pacific. So we have t -Corp undergoing an indirect, uh, undergoing new ownership by Southern Pacific. So the result of that is an indirect change in ownership of Title Insurance and Trust Co., which in turn owns California real property.
So the result of that is reassessment, a change in ownership of the properties owned by title insurance company. So classic example of transactions that happen all the time in the real world and an example of something that does trigger, trigger reassessment. So we have here in the slides a couple other examples, but what we'll do is for the sake of time, we'll move on to the final slide, which is an example of something that is not a change in ownership. And we talked a little bit about this case just a bit ago, Ocean Avenue case. Um, and Ben, if we could move to the very, very last of my slides, which is the Ocean Avenue slide. This case um, dealt with Michael Dell and his family. So Michael Dell is, of course, of famed ownership of Dell Computers. He was looking at buying the Miramont Hotel in Santa Monica. So he actually signed an original contract by which he created a brand new entity that he, the Dell, and his wife owned the new entity, and that new entity was going to acquire the hotel. In that instance, under the initial sales contract, it was change in control, no question about it. New entity acquired control of the hotel, and therefore the hotel would be subject to reassessment. Well, they took a step back after signing that initial sales contract and said, surely there's something we can do to structure this in a way that won't trigger a change in ownership. And so what they did was they restructured the sales contract. And instead of using a new entity to buy the hotel, they looked at the existing entity. And the existing entity was carved up and purchased by three categories of investors. The first was a 49% interest purchased by Susan Dell's separate trust. The second was effectively a purchase by Michael Dell of 42.5%. And lastly, you have the remaining 8.5% um, purchased by what is often called friends of the Dells, related entities of the Dells. And so here you see no one new entity or person, when you look at each individually, gained more than a 50% interest. We have 49 at the very most. And because no new entity or person gained ownership of the existing holding company, there was no change in ownership and the hotel continued to retain its existing Proposition 13 base year value. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of the current system. If you have any questions, like I said, I'm happy to take them either through a direct email or questions through Rob, but thank you for letting me speak with you this afternoon. Thank you, Brianne, for that wonderful discussion on uh, the current properties tax system here in California. And um, just wanted to let everyone know we will be getting to questions at the end of our uh, presentation. I know there are a couple of questions that have already popped up, um, and so we will get to those at the end. And so this is our second polling question here um, for everyone, just to make sure everyone is still awake. All right, and with that, we'll start our discussion of uh, some of the provisions of Proposition 15. And um, so we'll start with uh, the first one, which is uh, what exactly would Proposition 15 do? Um, so Proposition 15 proposes splitting the property tax assessment role um, and distinguishing between commercial and industrial properties and all other properties. Um, this is the primary reason why people commonly refer to Proposition 15 as the split role. And so what it would do, it, it would require uh, market value reassessment at least every three years for these commercial and industrial properties and all other properties would retain their current uh, protections under Proposition 13, which Brianne uh, just walked us through. And so the proposition does define uh, commercial and industrial properties in the text of Proposition 15. Um, and we will go more in depth into this and other definitions in the upcoming webinars in, in the following weeks. Um, but just for kind of a quick overview of what is in, in the initiative, 
Um, commercial and industrial property means any real property that is used as commercial or industrial property or is vacant land not zoned for residential use and not used for commercial agricultural production. Uh, vacant land also does not include real property that is used or protected for open space, a park, or equivalent designation uh, for land essentially free of structures, natural in character to pr provide opportunities for recreation and education, um, and intended to preserve scenic, cultural, or historic values. Uh, Proposition 15 also provides uh, kind of a limited protection or exception for small businesses. And so properties owned by individuals or businesses whose property holdings in the state total less than $3 million are exempt from that market value uh, reassessment and taxation. Proposition 15 also does contain a number of, of limited exceptions uh, within the text of the initiative itself. And so the first one is one that um, if you've seen some of the commercials either on TV or on the radio, I'm sure you, you've heard it already before, um, but it's for agricultural land. And so real property used for commercial agricultural production, which is defined in, the, in Proposition 15 as land that is used for producing commercial agricultural commodities, what exactly that means we'll get into in some of our following webinars, um, but that is, is the exception that is in the initiative itself. Proposition 15 also provides an ex exception for residential property, which is defined in the text of the initiative as real property used as residential property, which includes both single family and multi-unit structures, as well as the land on which those structures are constructed or placed. Um, this is one of the, the bigger exceptions within the initiative itself, trying to preserve that prop th the Prop 13 protection for these residential properties, at least for now. Um, Along with that, Proposition 15 would require the legislature to get involved uh, for some of these kind of definitional items and provisions to provide further guidance and clarification on exactly what they mean and exactly how they would apply. Um, we will get more into that, like I said, in some of our subsequent webinars, um, but just to kind of give you a quick overview of, of what's in the initiative itself. So for the operative dates of the initiative, if Proposition 15 passed in November, of the commercial and industrial property will be the fair market value as determined by the county assessor for the 2022-23 lien date, which um, in common terms or in layman's terms is January 1, 2022. Um, however, Proposition 15 does also provide a delay in, in implementation or reassessment uh, for certain properties, um, basically requiring that 50% or more of the property is occupied by a uh, small business, which is another term that is defined in the proposition itself. Um, but for those properties that are occupied 50% or more by qualified small businesses, um, the reassessment would be delayed until the 2025-26 lien date, which would be January 1st, 2025. And so the, the initiative defines a small business as a business with fewer than 50 uh, full-time equivalent employees. Um, the business must also be independently owned and operated and must have real property in California. And so those are the three requirements under the initiative itself to qualify um, as a small business. Um, next, jumping into some of the revenue estimates and allocation. Um, so in California, the Legislative Analyst Office, as well as the Department of Finance, are required by statute uh, to provide estimates of uh, proposed initiative measures financial impact on the state. And so according to the LAO's analysis of Proposition 15, uh, the split role would cost taxpayers between 6.5 and $11.5 billion annually, depending on the strength of the state's real estate market for that year. Um, and of this 6.5 to $11.5 billion in additional revenue, a majority of which does not even go towards education. According to the LAO's analysis of the initiative, approximately 60% would be allocated to cities, counties, and special districts, with the remaining 40% going to schools and community colleges. Um, this also does not take into account the administrative and implementation costs for, the, for Proposition 15, which would come off the top before any money is sent to local governments and schools. And so the next slide um, has some language on the uh, business personal property tax exemption, which is another topic that we will touch more heavily on in uh, some of our later webinars. Um, but Proposition 15 would provide a personal property tax exemption for taxpayers. Um, and for a quick kind of uh, summary, it provides a $500,000 personal property tax exemption per taxpayer. And so for this purpose, taxpayers are grouped together so that related entities would be considered a single taxpayer 
and would only receive one of these $500,000 uh, personal property tax exemptions. Um, again, small businesses, which um, are defined in the initiative that I provided earlier, um, receive special treatment under this provision as well. And so for those small businesses that qualify, they would receive a complete exemption for all of their personal property. And for the next slide, uh, I know this is a question that we have been getting um, kind of about whether or not Proposition 15 contains any provisions for oversight. And so Proposition 15 does have one provision in it that is intended to uh, provide some sort of oversight of this potential significant amount of new revenue. And so that is, is shown on the screen there. Um, but basically any uh, local government or entity, um, schools, special districts that receive any sort of new funding or revenue from Proposition 15 um, must publicly disclose the amount of property tax revenues that they received under the split rule and how those revenues were spent. Um, however, it's important to note that Proposition 15 does not have any provisions within it that would allow taxpayers to control or provide input into how these funds would be used or provide any recourse um, if there is a potential misuse um, of these funds. The next topic, um, it might not be too exciting, but uh, the constitutional spending limit or the GAN spending limit. And so Proposition 4 of 1979 amended the state constitution to impose spending limits, um, which are technically appropriations limits on the state and most local governments. Um, these limits are sometimes commonly referred to as GAN limits in reference to one of the measures co-authors, Paul GAN, which Dave Dorr uh, mentioned earlier in his, in his section of the webinar. Um, but basically the fundamental purpose of these limits was to keep inflation and population adjusted appropriations under the 1978-79 level. And so the measure required that any revenues in excess of the specified limit would be rebated or refunded to the taxpayers. And so the way that Proposition 15 deals with this is that Proposition 15 would exempt all of the new revenue that is collected by the initiative from counting towards this GAN limit. Uh, which would prevent uh, a triggering of a rebate or a refund to taxpayers um, because of this potentially significant amount of new revenue that would be coming to the state. And so the next question um, or topic that I know uh, probably everyone is interested in, uh, what is the vote threshold required for, the, for this initiative to pass? And so according to the California Constitution <clears throat> in Article 2, sorry, a statewide ballot measure only requires a majority, a simple majority vote to pass. And so that is a 50% plus one vote, um, which makes this initiative much harder than uh, normal tax increases here in California. Um, but that is what we have here in the constitution. And with that, um, those are pretty much uh, a quick overview of some of the most basic provisions of Proposition 15 and what it does. Um, unfortunately, due to time constraints um, and some of our other webinars that we have upcoming, we did not have time to go over all the provisions within Proposition 15 in detail. Uh, but if you are interested in more information about the initiative and exactly what it would do, uh, please visit our website at www.caltax.org, where you can find our in-depth analysis of the initiative and all of its provisions. And make sure to tune in for the rest of our webinar series every Tuesday in October, because we'll be going way more in-depth into the initiative and all the provisions of Proposition 15. And with that, I think we'll send it over to questions. Oh, sorry, forgot the poll. <laughs> uh, so this is our final poll here for everyone to answer. All right, and so uh, jumping into questions, um, please feel free to use either the chat function. I know some people have already used the uh, question and answer function to ask any questions and we'll um, do our best to answer those. And so the first question was, um, didn't golf courses get exempted from being valued at highest and best use with the passage of Proposition 13? And so actually, uh, Proposition Section 6 of 1960 um, added Article 13, Section 10 to the California Constitution, which exempts golf courses from being valued at their highest and best use. 
Um, there has been some analysis which kind of suggests that Prop 15 might override those protections, um, but this is definitely a great issue that we will jump more into in our next webinar series next week. And so the next question was, um, when there is seismic retrofitting of a non-residential business, does the owner need to file special paperwork to avoid reassessment for the seismic retrofit improvements? Take that one if you want, Ben. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so yes, uh, claim forms are typically required. Um, they're usually within 30 days of completion and it's a form that's available through likely the local assessor's website. If not, there's a sample form available on the BOE's website, but yes, Definitely claim form filed. You'll also have to follow it up with information to the assessor regarding the specific work that was done. So there's specific statutes and structures. I believe it's 74.5 is a statute that covers seismic retrofitting work. And it is only in existing buildings that it's excluded. Great. Um, and so our next question was, um, is it clear that assisted living facilities are considered residential and therefore exempt from Proposition 15? Then I can help with this one. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, so I would say that it is pretty clear from a lot of people who have taken a look at this, um, whether or not assisted living facilities are taxable under Prop 15, um, the assisted living um, Facilities Coalition has come in uh, and are funding the opposition campaign. Um, I can see how there may be some questions about whether or not it is residential, um, but from folks analysis, um, it does look like that would be taxable. Um, and that would be a great question to also ask our next series of, um, of panelists during the next webinar, because they'll be taking a look at some of the industry impacts for each kind of sector. Um, so that would be a, a great question to follow up with to see um, some analysis there. And on that, Rob, for future coming attractions, I think as you move from assisted living into skilled nursing facilities, um, it becomes even clearer that it's taxable. So I'm sure that's something you guys will be discussing, but lots of questions on that regard. Definitely. And so uh, one more question we have here, if Proposition 15 passes, what does expected phasing in look like? And so I think if, if Proposition 15 passes, um, there is that phasing period. And so uh, reassessment uh, would not begin until um, January 1, 2022. And so there is a little bit of time uh, where that kind of phasing in would happen. Uh, the legislature, like I mentioned would also have a lot of work to do in kind of clarifying and um, promulgating a lot of statutes to implement the initiative itself. Uh, and so the legislature is actually required in the initiative to form a task force on implementation kind of similar to what happened after Proposition 13. And so um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, phasing in and kind of implementation and guidance that will need to be done. Um, but that is also a topic that um, we'll be jumping more into in our third webinar series um, to, to talk more about what the State Board of Equalization would need to do and kind of the changes that they would need to implement in order to um, uh, phase in Prop 15. So we had a follow-up question to that, um, but will it, will it claw back to pass date, i.e. catch up tax? That is a great question um, and one that uh, you should ask next week to our panel because I think that is um, a topic that they will be touching on. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, I think we'll uh, conclude the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and join us next week at noon on Tuesday. Thank you so much.